All right. Thank you all for attending the first um, series of the International Journal of Triple R Law and Policies at Zumina. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we meet on the country of the Anaiwan people who share the caring of this country with Gumbagir, Kamila Roy, and Dankati peoples. I pay respect to their elders past, present, and emerging. Now, I also like to thank Professor Michael Adam, who is the head of school of the law school at UNE, for his guidance in organizing this seminar and the working group for the teamwork that is involved in putting this together. Now, our aim today is to discuss issues concerning the global, regional, rural, and remote population, and how law and governance deal or ought to deal with them. So our topics today concerns our everyday lives, one that concerns our survival as species in this world. We and the environment and everything that lives in it depends on it and will need to coexist. Now to begin, I will present first by way of, by way of an introduction to the area of discussions today by taking you through the following questions. What are the future food and the future food model practices? Why are these future food and models are important to be embraced? In other words, why are we rethinking about how we approach new food and new food models? And the last question is, what are the legal questions we are seeking answers with regard to these future food and future, food, future models? Okay, future food models. Then we will listen to our four speakers, whom I will introduce after my brief presentation. Now, may I ask you to mute your mic so that we could hear the presentations without interruptions. So what are the future food? Now, we often hear about new food and new ways of food being produced. So what are they? They are claimed to be nutritious and to be produced sustainably. Let me give you a few examples of these types. The cricket bars. They are claimed to contain three times more protein than beef and create 1,000 times less gas emission. Another type is Kernza. Now, Kernza is a new type of grains that allow, that grows differently than traditional wheat. Now, which this Kernza could lead to environmental benefits. There are roots, um, the roots grow 10 feet into the soil and they allow the plants to store nutrients they are good at resisting droughts and they reduce soil erosion. So Kernza can protect the soil while producing food for people to eat. Then we have plant burger. This is a new type of food. Food scientists have made peas and soy based burgers, which can bleed when you bite them. So the bleeding veggie burger contains no gluten and has less sodium and saturated fat. Another type is alga oil. Alga are being recognized as a long-term sustainable sources of biomass and oils for food, fuel, feed, and other core products. Microalgae can be cultivated to have high proteins and oil content and can be produced as biofuels or as animal feed or even as both. One more type that I will share with you. This is called 
the chicken nuggets. Now this is interesting and also somewhat concerning. Here, instead of killing a chicken, it is now possible to grow a chicken from a feather. So essentially, they pick a feather and the right set of nutrients from plants and will cause the cells to multiply. So basically, you will be eating chicken that is still alive and running in your backyard. And this is claimed to be incredibly sustainable. Now let's look at the future food models. So in order to produce this new food, agriculture and food model adapt a diverse practice. So you have alternate farming, vertical farming, stem grown food, functional agricultural food farming, and so on. I'm only giving you a few of these. Now, if you look at functional food agriculture, functional food are food that have a potentially positive effect on health beyond basic nutrition. So the proponents of this functional food say that they promote optimal health and help reduce the risk of disease. Okay. So why are we doing this? Why are we changing our ways of producing food and why are we introducing this new food? Why are we rethinking this? Now it is because we have serious environmental problems. They broadly include global warming, climate change, droughts, flood, forest, defor forest deforestation, biodiversity loss, marine life depletion, ocean dead zones, ocean depletion. Now, it can be argued that these problems contribute to the problems of food insecurity in terms of as well as nutrition. Mute, yeah, thank you. Now, environmental problems are caused by rising green, uh, greenhouse emissions, burning fossil fuels, more importantly by agricultural production. This is why we are looking at all these different types of food and the food productions. So what are the legal questions we are seeking answers from? Then what are they? First, do we have clear legislations and norms guiding the growth of future food industry? Is law an hindrance or a support to this new or potential new food industry? Is the absence of clear rules a major factor hindering the development of such industry? Do potential investors, farmers, and entrepreneurs of industrial, such industry, have difficulties identifying the appropriate regulations and law. Now, these are significant issues for legal academics as the law are typically seen to serve to constrain activities rather than as generating radical innovations. But remember, regulators often explore a risk-based approach to ensure food safety issues as well as biosecurity issues. So our presenters today will endeavor to answer most of these questions in the time allocated to them, which is 15 to 20 minutes. They will provide a synopsis of their paper but if you are interested to know more about their work, selected papers will be published in our journal, which is an open access. This means you can read them for free. Okay? You will have some question time at the end of all speakers' session. Now, without any further delay, I'm excited, extremely excited, to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Anu. Dr. Anu is a senior researcher at the Environmental Policy Center, Finnish Environment Institute. 
previously, she worked as a business law lecturer at the Toku School of Economics, Finland. Her research interest includes food system transitioner, basic rights and justice. And most recently, she studied the regulatory issues with insects and microalgae. Dr. Anu's presentation today is why the food system is difficult to change. With that, Anu, you may start now. Are you there, Anu? She's coming. Yes, I'm here. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Charlene. You can see my slides. Yes. Yeah, hello, I'm Anu. I, I'm glad to be invited to this webinar and I've known Charlene for a few years and we wrote together about food law before and it's nice to be here. This topic is uh, very interesting to me, this evolutionary psychology perspective to human behavior. And it's, I think it's particularly well suited to study food, food choice and food regulation because food is so close to species, survival, and a very important part of uh, decision-making in the tribal society where our brains have been e evolving. So the uh, name of the speech is human nature versus food system transition, because there are some hindrances in our brains and uh, species-specific tendencies that may, may hinder the adoption of these new foods Charlene was talking about, and also the moral issues of global value chains and food systems are difficult to grasp for our monkey brain part or the ancestors uh, adapted uh, environment was different than the global uh, food chain and value, value chains today. So there may be some hindrances there I will talk about. Uh, Charlene all, already mentioned the food system problems we eat uh, really unhealthy food, most most of people, and um, obesity is a really big problem. And it's uh, high calorie foods that are so so tempting for the, for the human. It's difficult to resist and to eat in this wide wide uh, selection of all the high calorie foods with sugars and fat everywhere. And and this causes a lot of problems. And then, then we have serious moral, moral problems in the food system related to human rights violations and forced labor, slave labor, child labor, and dangerous working conditions also in the food, food value chains. And environmental problems were already discussed. Uh, too, too much, too much uh, carbon emissions and uh, spoiling the soil and uh, using too much chemicals, harmful for biodiversity, and the land use as one of the main problems. The food system uses a lot of land and causes deforestation, and we, we all know these problems. Also, animal welfare can be discussed, the fa factory farm issues. So we all think that the transition is required to more sustainable food systems with the Healthy, healthier and more sustainable diets and production systems. And we should change it. And the law has uh, potential and law is one of the strong, stronger tools to change the system. The food law, food law, environmental law, agricultural policy, trade policy, public procurement rules, marketing law, a lot of different fields of law are re related to changing the food system. Uh, so, so what is this uh, evolutionary psychology and have to do have to do with the food system problems? A human uh, is an omnivore species, uh, eating almost everything. And one one uh, important decision is what to eat and what not to eat. And human is curious and cautious at the same time. So interested in trying new things, but still hesitant and uh, careful. So, because it's a risk of disease always when choosing to eat something different than the tribe has eaten before. And disgust is the relevant emotion here, because it's an emotion that has evolved for uh, disease risk avoidance and pathogen avoidance. And uh, so we are disgusted of 
things that may cause disease. And this is not uh, just uh, basic, only biology, because this uh, emotion develops in, in the social group. And if you see other, other people eating, your parents eating and giving you uh, food, then, then you will not be disgusted. So uh, human, human is uh, disgusted towards foods, has disgust towards foods that uh, they have not eaten as, as children. And there, there are differences uh, because we, uh, like with insects, there are different insects uh, like, um, like ant or grasshopper is uh, typically less disgusting than uh, worm or uh, fly because it's not uh, related to rotten meat. It's a grass, grass related thing. So these uh, survival instincts are relevant for the, even with the insect species that we find disgusting. Even though we never ate any insects, well, uh, six, six billion people didn't use and two billion people did use, so there's a difference. And these uh, food cultures are also based on uh, local nutri nutrition avail availability. So like here in Finland, we don't have that many good bugs around uh, that are nutritious compared to other food sources like, like the moose. So, so we didn't de develop uh, this food culture of eating insects here. But now many of Finns are interested in trying and uh, overcoming this disgust through uh, trying trying these foods and seeing other people consume them. Also, nostalgia nostalgia is related to surviving childhood and preferring what you ate before because it's good. Uh, it's uh, evidence of uh, being uh, non-risky. If you survived the childhood, then the food was probably good. So no no uh, reason to change that. Uh, females and males uh, are different because of different strategies and uh, in reproduction and different uh, ways of uh, surviving and gaining status. So a neophobia, uh, being uh, cautious of new foods and new things is greater with females because of the risk, uh, more risk, because you, you not, not only risk yourself but also the fetus and the child is dependent on you, maybe even three people at the same time, because if you, you take a disease and or die, then it's a risk for uh, also your children. Uh, okay, now I move on to morality, because uh, this uh, what tastes good and what is disgusting is related to survival module uh, of the evolutionary psychology basic modules. And we have the survival and uh, uh, reproduction and kinship favoring the family and then then uh, reciprocity and morality and uh, working in the bigger tribe and being so social and moral uh, module and many of the food system issues are related to extending our morality to far away things because we used to uh, we developed our morality in circumstances where we always meet the same people and everybody knows what we have done but now we lack this transparency and that I think causes many of the problems. We are not uh, feeling moral enough or enough guilt to act because we don't see directly what our action causes in distant places and for di different people and peoples. Uh, basic behavioral economist uh, studied by behavioral economists is basic uh, Human biases in decision making are, are also have their evolutionary background. Short sightedness is related to taking resources uh, now uh, rather than later. And uh, status quo bias, uh, not, not changing the uh, habitat or the tribal, tribal's location, uh, may, may not be uh, so uh, good to go to new places if the uh, you, you already know your territory and can defend it and know, know this place. So, so it may favor this uh, keep, keeping to what you already have attitude. Optimism bias also may, may be related to this uh, tendency of humans to prefer optimists as leaders because they believe in this, themselves and convince others. And then we, we have more optimists as leaders than, than pessimists. Uh, moral emotions are uh, very relevant, I think, in uh, 
consumer behavior, also in regulator behavior. And I believe that uh, as regulators, we are more moral than as consumers. And we can also see this in supermarket behavior versus voting behavior. And not everybody buys all the time responsible, maybe 5% uh, even care about or uh, decide based on moral uh, things like environmental justice or human rights when they go shopping. But as, uh, as legislators, we are more, more responsible. And this may uh, be one of the levers that can change the system because uh, the um, parliament, at the parliament, our legislative behavior is visible and transparent to everybody. And we have to defend this publicly, but that's not the case in the supermarket shopping. And guilt is a relevant, relevant emotion. Uh, guilt is the emotion for not having done enough. You notice that I have caused uh, problems for uh, important people and uh, I have a risk of losing my reputation and I have risk of being seen as a not a pro-social person. So then you will feel guilt. Also anger is relevant, anger towards those people who, who are doing wrong and angry people um, can make good regulators. So I would try, I would try to present some solutions. I have, I have said that if you, for humans it's difficult to change to low calorie, calorie foods because survival favors high calorie and varied diets. And also I have said that we are disgusted of new things we, because we didn't eat, eat them before, they are suspicious, but we can overcome this. And then I said that the morality is difficult to extend to far away places that are not visible. So now I have some solutions here uh, in the end of the presentation. So uh, help, uh, how to overcome disgust is through exposure and example. If you see other people surviving it, then you will start to feel it's okay. And you can see, you can see the opinion leaders try it and you can see that uh, people are eating it. And you can, if you will taste it and uh, taste that it's not that strange tasting, if it tastes good, it's a great. So, so that's a good, good thing for any new food if it tastes similar to meat, like, like Charlene said, this uh, plant-based burger with this bloody, bloody taste. And so this gust can be overcome because it's just for uh, being cautious first, this emotion. Uh, and transparency is uh, very important. If everybody can see what you, what you do, or what kind of food you buy and consume at the restaurant and how you vote and people keep records, records and discuss this in the media and, and behavior is visible, eyes on you uh, effect is important for human morality and social pressure. Uh, if you can see what everybody else is buying, how everybody else is eating, how everybody else is uh, doing in other countries, so you will compare and try to be as moral as the others, not too much, because uh, also being too moral is harmful for human survival if you always give more than you get and do more than everybody else. So uh, that's why uh, people don't want to be too too high in the uh, pro-social, like not have a reputation of being a sucker to ex be exploited by other countries, by other people, other, other tribes. So social pressure to be have a prestige uh, so that everybody speaks good things about you, important for human. And also we, we understand uh, what kind of environment is healthy for survival. So like clean water, uh, plenty of uh, plants and animals, and uh, water is very important. So we can harness this in uh, political, uh, social marketing, and political campaigns uh, to contrast the spoiled uh, earth with the healthy environment that is uh, looking good for survival. And moral emotions uh, are there uh, because human is really a moral animal and wants to do the, have the good reputation and being pro-social and uh, correcting the wrongs and uh, uh, helping those who need, need the most help because gratitude is also a measure of this uh, helping the uh, things, uh, the people that have the biggest problems. So expected gratitude can also be one of the uh, emotions relevant here. Uh, if we see narratives and visualizations and stories and videos are important 
to understand and bring bring the things closer. Also, it's uh, uh, good to uh, de define the problem so that everybody can have answers and act. You feel like you can change the system because uh, if you see two large problems, you cannot change the world to a to better, better direction. Then you will use the moral excuses that uh, I cannot do it. Uh, somebody else should do it or it cannot be done or it doesn't have to be done because you try to cope with this uh, difficult uh, situation by uh, distancing your own, own actions and freeing yourself from thinking about it. So I have to be possible and positive and encouraged towards action. Uh, okay, I, I think maybe I use my 15 minutes, I don't, I don't know. Uh, but uh, I would like to discuss more uh, in the end of the uh, session and also through email. Azuke is the Finnish Environment Institute. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Anu, uh, for a very thought provoking uh, presentation. I can see how, why we are such complicated species when it comes to food. Um, so we'll move to our second presenter. Our second presenter is Professor Marcia. Now Marcia has woken up at 3 a.m. to be with us. Marcia is an attorney of the state of Parana in Brasilia and a professor of environmental law and administrative law. She teaches environmental law and administrative Law and she has published four books and organized a few. Her topic today is about farming and a biodiversity, biodiversity loss in Brazil. So with that, I introduce uh, Marcia, Professor Marcia from Brasilia to speak. Okay, well, good morning for all of you. It's very early here in Brazil. Good evening for you in the other parts of, parts of the world, especially in Australia. Let me try to share here. Uh, okay. So, uh, so I thank you, Charlene, for the invitation. Very happy to be here and participating in another UNE activity, specially organized by you. And the idea uh, in my presentation is to show what producing food in the old fashioned way can cause to our environment, especially here in Brazil, in the Amazon region, one of the biggest uh, uh, tropical forests in the world, very important for climate regulation in the whole world very important for biodiversity uh, preservation. And we are destroying it because we are growing food the old way, especially cattle and soybeans. Okay, so this is just a, a, a map of South America and Brazil. Brazil is the fifth uh, largest country in the world. So it's a huge territory with 220 million people. Those are our biomes. So you can see in the north part of Brazil, the Amazon uh, forest, it's uh, about 50% of our territory was uh, uh, covered by this huge forest. In the coastal area, we have another forest, that's the Atlantic forest. That one was destroyed because of the, the, the economic cycles here in Brazil. Now, since the, the, the 1500, when Brazil was discovered by Portugal and colonized, and we had sugarcane, coffee, now soybeans, destroying it. And also our industries and largest cities are all in the coastal area. Uh, we have here another map showing those two tropical uh, forests and also, we have here Caatinga in the Northeast, but it's a very small biome. No, it's a more uh, uh, desertic place, although it's not a desert. And in the middle, we have uh, Cerrado, 
Cerrado is like a savanna, but it's being destroyed in a very fast uh, pace because of soybeans. And in the south of Brazil, uh, we have grasslands being destroyed with cattle. And Pantanal, that's a very small biome here, uh, that's wetlands, that's being destroyed with rice. So we have uh, all our biomes affected by the way we have been growing food traditionally since Brazil was discovered by the Portuguese. You can see here the arc of deforestation. So deforestation is pushing inside the Amazon forest, especially with cattle and soybeans. So what happens is people come, cut the, 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 the trees, destroy the, the, the forest, plant grass, put cattle, or plant soybeans. And in about 10 years, no production at all because the soil in Amazon is not a very fertile soil. What keeps it fertile is the, 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 the forest. So when you cut, in no time it becomes a desert. And here you can see deforestation rates in Amazon since 1988. I don't have the 2020 here, but you can see there were peaks of deforestation here in 1988 and 2019. And uh, we, we are beginning to have, you know, the increase of deforestation again. So we had a very successful program to uh, diminish the, the deforestation in the Amazon region since 2005, 2006, and then deforestation began again. And last year, uh, we had another record, you know, since 2014, and unfortunately, deforestation is growing very fast, okay? So we had last year an increase of 99.5% if compared to uh, uh, 2019. So 2020, we had a huge deforestation. You can see by the numbers here how things are not well in our uh, Amazon region. Even inside protected areas, deforestation is growing fast, very fast. And that's something that I'm very scared about because protected areas should be protected and they are not. They've been invaded and people are putting cattle and planting soybeans, especially soy, inside uh, protected areas in the Amazon region. If we compare January uh, 2016 and January last year, you see how deforestation increased. So we have January in 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20, and you see that is going up and up. And this year we had already a huge deforestation in January, much higher than in January 2020. Those photos I think are incredible. They show how the forest in Amazon was in 1988 and how it was in 2018, and remembering that now it's much worse. So what food production in the traditional way can do to one of the most important biomes in the world. So what can I say? Brazil has a modern and restrictive legislation about uh, environmental protection, okay? And we have a, a, a modern legislation in agriculture, of course, not about producing food in a different way or not about modern food, but at least in producing food, not in such a destructive way. But the problem here is enforcement. We're not able to enforce this legislation. It's a huge challenge. And we have another problem now. Our current government is not much into environmental protection, not at all, you know? He's just about economy and just more or less like Trump in US. So he wants, you know, our GDP 
to grow and he is encouraging people uh, to invade new areas and to cut the forest. So uh, what happens? You know, is why is deforestation in the Amazon region so important? Because it impacts the whole world. It impacts the whole world because we lose biodiversity, because of climate change, because this region is a huge producer of fresh water. So according to World Bank's data, the Amazon region uh, has 40% of the world's remaining tropical forests, 25% of the world's biodiversity. We have more species of fish uh, than any other river system in the planet, and we produce 20% of all the fresh water in the world. So that's why the Amazon forest is so important, and that's why we should be protecting it, not destroying it. Uh, according to Greenpeace, deforestation increased 30% between 2020, uh, 2018 and 2020. And uh, there were 28% increase in fire spots in the Amazon. So the Amazon burned last year and will burn again this year in the dry season. Nothing is being doing, done about that. And the two states, Amazon has nine states, but the two states that are more complicated are Pará and Mato Grosso because they are the largest agriculture and livestock uh, producers, you know, in Brazil. So deforestation, those two states, these states are, is horrible. And we can see here that since 1988 until today, we have destroyed approximately uh, an area the size of Germany. So it's a lot of destruction in the Amazon region. And look, I'm just talking about the Amazon forests, okay? We have deforestation in Cerrado, we have deforestation in the Atlantic forest, but I think that the Amazon should be our goal, you know, trying to protect it would be good enough. Uh, and then why is it so, uh, uh, why is it being destroyed, you know? Because agriculture and livestock sectors here in Brazil are, res are responsible or respond to one third of our jobs. So we have 94.5 million workers in Brazil, 30 million workers, they work in those sectors. And 43% of the, our export products come from agribusiness or came from agribusiness last year. And it's the same this year. And agribusiness corresponds to 21% of, uh, of our GDP. Okay, so it's much bigger than 10 years ago. And we are in the middle of a very huge economic crisis. We had a serious crisis in 2015 and 16. You know, and it ended with our president being impeached here. And uh, we have a very huge economic crisis now, again, because of COVID-19. The whole world is suffering. Brazil is suffering a lot. We are now the hot spot of COVID. Uh, we, we are having about 2,500 deaths every day. People are losing jobs. The government is against lockdowns. So the governors of each state, they have to decide lockdowns, but then our president said that if they do lockdowns, they will not receive any help from the federal government. So it's a, a, a mess. We are in the middle of a humanitarian crisis here. And to, for you to see why uh, producing food is so important here in the old fashioned way, you can see our share in sugar, coffee, orange juice, soy, chicken, beef, corn, and pork. So uh, we are responsible, we are the, the, the second producer of sugar, the first you can see here, this is 
the first one is production, the first in coffee, first in, in orange juice, second in soy less, uh, uh, 2019, but in 2020, we began the first in soy, we, we passed the, the United States, second in chicken, second in beef, third in corn, fourth in pork. So uh, agribusiness here is huge. No. And if we, th if we think about exports, we are the first in almost all those products. And uh, uh, the percentage here in the last one is our share in the world uh, uh, production and the world exports. So this means that in 2020, Brazil produced 125 million tons of soybeans and the expectations is that it will produce 133 million tons in 2021. It means more deforestation, okay? We are also the second largest beef producer in the world. No, we, we, ha we had last year uh, 244 million units. And the problem is that we have here an extensive uh, 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 cattle production and or cattle raising, and that means that we have one hectare per animal. What's something unbelievable? One hectare per animal in Brazil means a lot of land, you know, being left there with a few, you know, uh, uh, oxes or cows. And uh, several new areas of forest have been cleared last year and will be cleared this year to be turned into pasture. So food production is important, of course, but preserving the Amazon forest is much more. We have to think about more sustainable ways to produce food and about future food. We have to think about uh, overpassing our prejudice against insects that Charlene has been, you know, for so long speaking about, because it will be the only way to protect biomes that are important for the whole world. We will not be able to continue in this rate of destruction if we want to regulate climate in the world. And the Amazon forest is a, a, a key to regulate climate. So uh, if it continues to be destroyed in the pace it has been destroyed in the last years, we won't be able to regulate climate in the world. You know, uh, it will be faultless. And uh, if we don't change our, the, the way how we see uh, sustainable development, how we see the economic uh, 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 growth as not the most important thing, we will continue to destroy. So that's the reality. We are a menace to the whole world because we are, uh, we are a menace to climate change and we are a menace to biodiversity preservation. So that was what uh, I wanted to say. We have to change. We have to find new ways. Brazil is not trying. We don't uh, 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 do anything about new ways of producing food or new ways of eating here. We are just uh, concerned about our GDP. So I think I'm, uh, I use it just my time. I hope <laughs> I didn't pass. And I thank you again, Charlene, for the opportunity to be here with you again. I'm very, very happy. Thank you, Marcia. I think we are much more happier to have you present to us today about the uh, land clearing for agricultural land, which is a major concern in many parts of the world, including Australia. 
and I hope that we will see some progress to save the Amazon forest or any forest in the world. And this be considered, you know, future food being considered seriously in order to save the planet. Thank you, Marcia, for, um, for coming up at uh, so early hours for us to, to tell us. I'm, I mean, you're the best person to explain this um, farming um, and deforestation. And, and, you know, you're the best person. Yeah, thank you so much. Now, our first, third presenter is also someone in a similar area. Um, who's going to talk about uh, farming as well. Um, she is Mur Shamshul Kamaria, who is an academic at the Faculty of Law and International Relations of University Sultan Zainal Abidin, Kuala Terengganu, Malaysia. She teaches law of equity, trust law, and intellectual property. Her research includes intellectual property law, farmers' rights, biotechnology law, gender, and child issues. She's currently completing her PhD on a part-time basis. Her topic is about COVID-19 pandemic and the impact of that on food system, the Malaysian experience. Now, her presentation will concentrate on how Malaysia copes on food availability and supply during the COVID-19. And it will also highlight the impact of restriction of movement order on food supply, availability and prices on consumers and producers of food. And she will highlight on the policy and initiative taken by the government to ensure food security is protected in Malaysia. With that, I introduce you to Mur Samshol from Malaysia. Right. Thank you very much, Salim. And thank you also for inviting me to this uh, webinar. Well, it's an honor, but it's also very daunting because I have, wow, uh, respected and experts in, the, in, the, in their field compared to me. Nonetheless, let's share screen and I hope I can contribute a little bit, if not more, to this uh, discussion on food system. Just a moment, I'm having a little bit of... So this is what uh, my topic is all about. This is a real life experience uh, pertaining to how COVID-19, the pandemic which affect the globe, affect Malaysia, particularly in terms of the food system. Right now, um, why I'm talking about this? Because Malaysians are very complacent in the sense that they think that the food is going to be available for us and we're going to have access to food at every uh, turn of the corner. Uh, I would say Malaysia is a heaven for eating outside. And, and I would say that uh, the food uh, produced in, in our country, I would say, is more local uh, rather than exported. Now, uh, currently, we are more concerned with food security, even though it has been uh, continuously been debated for a while. Uh, but it was not uh, on the issue of its sustainability, but more on its access and availability to the consumers. And not so much on the nutritious, but rather uh, nutritional value of the food, uh, but rather on how it can be assessed and how it's available on a uh, table consumers. As a country, Malaysia is able to produce 70% out of its food products and uh, it has been uh, doing so until, uh, well, I would say until now, but we also imported about 30% of other food items, particularly, I would say, milk and also meat uh, from Australia and also New Zealand, besides other countries. We are self-sustained in terms of uh, 
uh, I would say the local vegetables, as well as poultry and eggs, and also when come to pig uh, products or pork. Right? Now, because of because of the the diversity of uh, food, or is this currently uh, the food import has increased by three point five percent in two thousand. 18 and it is at a shocking 60 billion uh, well that's 60, uh, 60 billion ringgit malaysia not usd nonetheless that's a big fair chunk of our money going out of the country whereas we have a lot of spaces for food plantation or food production nonetheless that that would be another issue that i can discuss in another at another time now how does COVID-19 impact the food system or the food access and accessibility in Malaysia? But basically due to the restriction of movement control order. And after this post-pandemic, I think the Malaysian government is now thinking, what should we do? Say that the pandemic come to a continuous nature for the next two years, we might be having import restriction they eat other countries because we are importing rice from vietnam as well as thailand and we should this country stop or uh, uh, all their uh, export then we might be having a problem because rice is the staple food in malaysia and uh, without rice and our food security in malaysia is currently uh how shall I say? is guided or the yardstick is that would we be having enough rice for the citizen so it is naturally integrated as to whether the country is able to produce food for domestic consumption right so it is uh i would say uh lean towards whether we can produce rice now uh, as I mentioned, only 70% of our rice are grown at local uh, domestic production, but the other 30% came from overseas. Okay. Uh, I, academics, or I would say jurisprudence has stated that if you uh, link food security only to self-sufficiency, this is a misguided and efficient and costly uh, way to achieve food security. And this is also a way where political wills are more into uh, play rather than the economics uh, policies when you do, uh, when you rely on self-sufficiency rather than other types of uh, interpretation on food security. Now, the main ministry which is concerned about agriculture is the ministry of agriculture and agro-based industry and this particular ministry is the one is responsible for any farming activities as well as the food security policy malaysian first food security policy uh, was introduced in 2008 and it covers for the period until 2010 now that was because of the food crisis in 2008 globally which saw the price increase in almost all food items. The Malaysia, even though imported food, 30% of its food items from outside, that uh, pertaining to uh, its ranking under the Global Food Security Index, under whether it's available or accessible to uh, the consumers, Malaysia uh, in 2019 ranked 28 and is considered as a good performing country. The main issue when we talk about food in Malaysia is the increase of the food item. Uh, well, I would say the previously, uh, 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 what you call it, uh, cauliflower might cost you only $2.60 or $4.60 uh, per kilo is now is almost seven to eight ringgit. So not dollars ringgit currently right now the reason for the food increase is basically because malaysia is more uh, the the 
So I would say the local consumption is considered as second rather than for export purposes, All right? Because it will, most of these local products are exported now, the export is mainly to Singapore, where they don't have much land to plant things and vegetables. Thus, the vegetable producer or the food producer, food item producer such as foods would focus on exporting to the Singapore and also a few other small countries rather than for the local consumption. As such, it became scarcity in the food market, local domestic market, and as such, it is an increase in the price. That is a reality. I can vouch for that uh, personally. Right now, how about COVID-19? How does it impact the food system in Malaysia? Similar to other countries, when we were hit with the pandemic, we have restrictions on traveling and movement, known as MCO, Movement Control Order, in two phases. Now, when you say Movement Control Order, this is a total lockdown, meaning nobody can leave the house except for, uh, well, taking your essentials, and a very, uh, only one or two members of the family can go out. The first phase would be from 18 March to 4th May 2020 to contain the, the, the pandemic, and then second phase is from 1st January 2021 until almost recently, uh, currently 31st March 2021. Now, uh, the current um, MCO is a bit more uh, lenient in the sense that certain targeted areas are under this, well, I would say, a very restricted movement. But for country uh, states which have less number of infected COVID-19 patients, then we are allowed to travel. As such, it will be easier on the market and economy. Throughout the MCO, transportations and movement or agricultural produce are allowed, despite the fact because we are food uh, uh, from this agricultural produce. So the reality is that even though there was no restriction, uh, I would say less restriction on transportation of movement or agriculture produce, supply of food from farm to table was disrupted. Why do I say that? Because of the necessity for clearance, documentations, and also health screening. So the first MCO had a very bad impact on all food uh, consumers as well as food producers compared to the second MCO because certain economic sectors has been allowed to uh, operate under the second, economic, uh, second uh, MCO. So Malaysian food market are made up of uh, hypermarkets and supermarkets and also these small retailers or what we know as provision shop, shops, grocery shops, sundry shops, markets and also the weekly pop-up markets plus outside stalls and mobile vendors. So the 56% of these markets which uh, derive their, uh, their food products or food items are from smallholder farmers. And these 56% retailers afford the main bulk of uh, affordable and accessible food for the lower income consumers, which are a majority of them, particularly in the urban areas. Right. Now, when you talk about smallholder farmers, there's always issue of uh, uh, their accessibility or understanding of the documentation needed and complying with procedure. And as such, they have a bit of problem to market their supplies due to the uh, MCO. They also lack the suitable transportation because due to the MCO, there's a lot more of uh, police roadblocks where you are uh, required to show your documentation and as such, it will hinder the progress of your uh, food transport time in, 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 uh, in terms of time. And as such, they were, uh, they were having problems with that. Okay, uh, so there are instances or there has been reported cases where farmers have to throw away the vegetables, right, and or leave them as feed to animals due to non-availability, non, uh, impossibility to 
distribute them or market them to this all retail to these retailers. Okay. So the food are uh, fruits and vegetables or perishable goods are the one most affected, and these are where the smallholder farmers are affected. Now, when we see, I say smallholder farmers in Malaysia, they are very small in acreage. I would say from uh, one to uh, 10 acres, that is considered a small holder, right? And comparatively in Australia, uh, I say less than 50 hectares is, is small, <laughs> but in Malaysia, it's less than 20 acres or about 10, 10 plus hectares. Now, so the food producers who are the mark farmers are having market surplus of their produce, right? And the demand was decreased due to the MCO. Nobody can walk around. There's no wet market open to avoid the, the close contact, right? So as such, 60% of them were unable to sell their products during the first MCO. And also, they also have a problem in loss of labor force because in Malaysia, there's a lot of migrant as well as local workers and uh, they have to undergo health screening and lockdowns, right? Uh, and the 14 days or 10 days of period. And also when they were sick, they have to be um, uh, hospitalized and as such, quarantine procedures have to be followed. So they lost a lot of labor force to the food producers. And, and they were also involved in processing and packaging. So only 70% of the Food producers are allowed or are able to operate at normal operating capacity, which are bigger uh, farmers compared to the small farmers. And uh, the, the closure of the wet market as well as the fresh markets uh, also impacted them. And the main thing is about investment on the agriculture sector is as, as usual in Malaysia is put on at home. All right, uh, because Malaysia has change from an agriculture country to an industrialized country. As such, uh, agriculture has been given a, 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 a sideline when it talks about uh, investment. Okay, And the problem to the food producers is also due to their inability to obtain the, the, the farmers' uh, far, farming uh, uh, items such as seeds and fertilizers at the correct time or within the, the time stipulated for their harvest and for their uh, planting and as such it breaks the food production. As to the retailers, the middlemen, they have reduced demand due to the closure of all these markets and the 48% of them were uh, suffering from this distribution constraint. If they did so, they have to endure this additional time and costs due to the health restriction on each and every individual uh, who is uh, going to and fro throughout the country. And when there are uh, cases of uh, perishable and uh, spoil uh, food due to the extended delays for food containers, due to the lack again of uh, labors to assist in all these matters and and for the food industry restaurants hotels they were severely affected there was huge reduction in demand of whatever uh, eating outside and therefore they well i would say 30 percent of the small one was uh was asked well had to shut down the operation uh, even until the end of this year, I will not be able to say whether they will be able to operate at a normal level. Okay, And also they have logistic and transportation difficulties. Again, it disrupted the movement of food items. Now, how about the impact on food consumers? Okay. Uh, the first MCO, we see... Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah? Yeah. Time, time is uh, almost getting close to your time. Oh, okay. so kind of, yeah, you have about three minutes. So okay. can you sort of wrap it up a little bit? Yeah. 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 So uh, for the food consumers, these are, they are having a problem with uh, only the price and also assess because of the panic buying and the food hoarding. And also because of the income loss or the inability to purchase food items. Now, after the MCO, there's a price hike in almost everything. And then food affordability is another problem which we need to have a, a research on. 
Okay, now, so basically I can divide it. What are the government initiative and policy? First or uh, foremost, the best thing is that now we have a National Food Security Council, which was initiated in May 2020. It's not under the Ministry of Agriculture, but it's under the Prime Minister of Cabinet level, which include ministers, senior government officers, and experts, as well as academicians, which are going to come up with uh, policies as well as plan of action to ensure food security, and we hope that it will materialize soon. But and due, uh, because of this, we have these financial policies to help the food producers as well uh, throughout uh, during the MCO before uh, first phase, we have the food basket designation, which was under the Ministry of Women and also it, with participation from NGOs as well as private sectors and individuals. And then we have the economic stimulus package of 260 million for farmers, micro and small media enterprises and 1 billion, this is all ringgit Malaysia, food security fund for farmers, fishermen and breeders. All right, so these all are done to enhance uh, the uh, and facilitate food supply change and we open the fresh market outlets uh, with a strict uh, SOP in April 2020 and also now people are turning to e-commerce platform and ordering their food items, even fresh one from this uh, e-commerce platform, as well as storage and uh, distribution uh, facilities. Now, uh, as a conclusion, well, I think my time is up. Okay, Malaysia has been affected economically, but it does not uh, affect the whole food security system. It can only see, says that in terms of availability, that is the cost, disruption in the food supply. Nonetheless, when it comes to food affordability, there is another story altogether which needs further research. The food supplies are ad adequate. The financial stimulus has uh, assist the local agribusiness, but whether it's going to be affected uh, or whether the, the price will be reduced, that is another story altogether. All right, with that, I end my uh, presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. Um, well, COVID has been unkind to people, but in some ways it has been kind to the environment and to the animal. So it gave the planet a bit of time to breathe and to recover. Now, COVID has changed the way we do things. Perhaps it could also change the way we approach the food system. And um, Sham's uh, presentation has highlighted what COVID has done to the food system. Now, with that, we move on to our last speaker for today, which is um, Dr. Sh Sheila Jayabalan. Now, she's an associate professor at the Faculty of Law, University Technology, Mara. And she's written, written various articles on various topics relating to her area of expertise. And she has also authored several books. Now, her main area of expertise includes children food security policy in Malaysia. Now, her topic today, however, concerns insects. Now, this is a new area that she's exploring, and I'm welcoming her to the team that explores <laughs> insects. Right, so she's going to look at the legal protections governing eating insects in Malaysia. Uh, her title is Insects as Food and Feed, Old or New, It's Time for Better Food Laws in Malaysia. With that, Sheila, I present the, the, the session to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Shalin. And thanks a lot for uh, inviting me um, and also roping me in uh, into this very interesting uh, topic on insect eating, but um, if you were to ask me, I don't think so. I'm, I'm still not that adventurous uh, into, you know, uh, getting my taste buds uh, to eating insects. But maybe I can overcome the fear uh, applying some of the methods uh, suggested by Anu <laughs> on, you know, overcoming the fear. Um, okay, a very good evening from Malaysia. Um, as Dr. Shalin had said, uh, the topic for my presentation is on insects as food and feed, 
old or new, it's time for better food laws in Malaysia. Okay, let me first of all um, go through uh, two issues. That is, why should we consider insects as a source of food or feed? And uh, insect cons consumption, also known as entomophagy, um, is it old or new? Okay, firstly, um, why should we consider insects as source of food or feed? Well, simply because um, one of the main uh, issues or the main factor is in relation to food insecurity. Uh, as data uh, states that 11% of the world's population are undernourished and 820 million people globally are undernourished and 22% uh, of children younger than five are stated to be stunted and they are significantly shorter than the average for their age uh, because of poor nutrition and repeated infection and 9% of the world population that is about 697 million people are severely food insecure so one in four people globally or 1.9 billion are moderately or severely food insecure. Now, uh, looking into food insecurity, uh, rather than focusing on the current sources of food, or what we should do is we should be finding alternate sources, uh, such as insects, uh, for sustainable uh, as a sustainable uh, measure. Furthermore. Uh, as far as uh, consumption of insect um, is, I wouldn't say it's not, it's not new, okay? It is rather old because history dates, history states that, you know, um, in Greek uh, literature, how Aristotle of Athens describes that, you know, cicadas, especially male ones, are better to eat, but uh, after copulation, the female tastes better because it is a full of eggs. And uh, also the royals of uh, Nivane, this is a place in Iraq, uh, they are very fond of eating locusts. Okay, locusts is something that, you know, um, during my younger time I used to catch and play because it makes a lot of noise, but uh, it never crossed my mind that I can, you know, I can actually uh, put it into my mouth and eat it, okay? And as far as the natives are concerned, I don't think so, uh, not just in, in Malaysia, uh, especially Sabah and uh, Sarawak, the natives of Sabah and Sarawak, but I think um, all over the world, the natives uh, from all parts of the world uh, have been consuming uh, insects and it is a source of food, okay? It is considered as a source of food. And if you were to look into the neighboring countries, um, neighboring countries of Malaysia, such as Thailand, Vietnam, and uh, Laos, okay, uh, insects are consumed uh, and they are sold as uh, street food. Um, so, uh, and however, okay, however, in the EU or other Western countries, um, I think insect eating is um, relatively new uh, because, uh, for example, in the EU, insects are still considered as a novel food. That is, uh, it's, not a, it's not a common food because it is stated here that, you know, novel food means food that has not been consumed to a significant degree by humans before the 15th May uh, 1997. But in, in fact, the, it, it has been eaten uh, by human beings, uh, you know, as uh, Anu said, human beings are omnivores. Uh, so therefore, the, I, either, either to eat to live or live to eat, you know, uh, insects have been eaten, okay, insects have been uh, eaten. Uh, but as far as Malaysia is concerned, um, I don't think so. We are as adventurous as our neighboring uh, countries. Uh, eating uh, insects is, is still considered as yucky. It's still revolting. Uh, it's still uh, disgusting. And the moment uh, when you look at insects, you only think of killing them. You only uh, very quickly uh, get your hands into Ripset, Motin, 
you know, to spray and uh, kill them straight away. So I don't think so. It has still, it has yet to cross our mind that, you know, insects can actually be breeded, can be harvested, and it can, can be eaten as uh, food for human consumption, as well as feed uh, for, for animals. But however, regardless of uh, the practice of uh, eating insects is old or new, the concern, however, is on the adequacy of the laws that should regulate uh, entomophagy or eating and insects, uh, especially uh, as a source of food. So the next question is, why do we need laws? Why do we need laws to regulate insects as, uh, as food or feed? Well, um, whether disgusting or revolting, uh, it is eating insects is catching uh, the attention of the consumers' taste buds. Okay, so more and more consumers, uh, let it be for medicinal value, or let it be as a delicacy, or let it be as a common food. Um, safety precautions and control measures uh, are needed, uh, especially right from the time um, it is uh, farmed, okay, and right up to the time it comes to our plate. Okay, so from farm to fork, we need uh, regulative uh, measures. So the next question is, in Malaysia, are the laws sufficient to regulate insects as food or feed? Literature search, as far as laws in, uh, in Malaysia is concerned, uh, insect-related legislations are as follows. Okay, you've got the Destruction of Disease-Bearing Insects Act. You've got the Prevention and Control of Infectious Disease Act. And you also have the Pesticides Act. You've got the Plant Quarantined Act. So the inferences that you can draw uh, by looking into these uh, legislations are one and only. That is, you know, these legislations merely govern uh, the destruction and uh, control of disease-bearing insects. So insects are not only considered as revolting, uh, the insects are also considered as unsafe, uh, insects are considered as disease-bearing, and generally uh, insects are seen as, uh, as pests. Uh, as to whether Malaysia has got laws as to the general standards of food, yes, we do. Okay, we do have laws uh, governing the general standards of food. We've got the Feed Act. Okay, we've got the Feed Act 2009. Now, uh, this law uh, regulates feed quality by controlling uh, import, by controlling the manufacture, sale and use of feed and feed uh, additives. And it also is to ensure that the feed satisfies nutritional and require, nutritional requirement of animals, and it is not harmful to animals and it is not contaminated, so that animals and animal products are safe for, uh, for animal consumption. Uh, so that is provided in the Feed Act. And we also have the Food Act um, 1983. Uh, this is just a general law uh, that regulates uh, food safety standards. Okay, right from the time uh, of preparation, the packaging, packaging, uh, the labels and the selling, or even the transporting of uh, food. Uh, especially it looks into the composition and uh, the emphasis is on the quality and the safety of uh, food standards uh, in Malaysia. Uh, but basically, the food standards uh, conform to the international food standards, that is the codex. Okay, apart from that, we also have uh, food regulations, 1985, uh, that regulates on the, on the uh, labeling uh, measures. So these are generally laws uh, that we have in, in Malaysia, okay, but we don't have any laws that are specifically uh, which specifically regulates uh, on uh, insects as food or feed. 
However, okay, however, um, what about the other countries? What are the global developments in other parts of the world? Um, when I looked into the laws of other countries, um, there's only one country that has got specific law on, uh, on, on insects, okay, as food and feed. That is uh, the law in, uh, in sorry, in uh, South Korea, okay, that is the act on fosterage and support of the insect industry. Now, this was the only law that um, I came across, you know, that is uh, actually, is actually regulating uh, insect as, uh, as food and feed, where uh, it uh, defines or uh, what type of uh, insects uh, can be uh, farmed. And not only that, it provides the responsibilities of the state and the, and the local uh, government. It's all, it also looks into the training of uh, experts uh, and it ropes in uh, designated universities, research institutes, uh, agencies, and organizations, okay, for the purpose of research on insects as uh, food and feed. And uh, most, the most important provision would be uh, it provides for the assessment of the potential harm caused by insects to prevent harm to the lives and bodies of, uh, of human uh, being, as well as uh, to the environment, uh, especially, um, especially potential harm that can occur in the process of uh, mass uh, breeding and uh, distribution of, uh, of insects. So it's one, um, it's one country that has got a, a comprehensive uh, law, okay? If, if, um, if insects are to be used for food and uh, food and feed. But comparing to the other parts of the world, uh, looking into Australia, New Zealand, it is, it is still considered as a novel, novel food and um, the general standards of uh, food safety applies. And the same goes for the EU countries where they have uh, novel food uh, regulations and uh, where if insect-based food are to be marketed, uh, they need authorization. Okay, so there's a process and procedure that, uh, that producers need to apply uh, and conform to. And then of course, you've got the Codex Elementarius, uh, which has not gotten into um, uh, what uh, looking into the safety net or safety measures of, um, of uh, manufacturing or producing insects as uh, food and feed. Uh, other than that, uh, you have in the UK, okay, research consortiums, as well as in Kenya, where they are looking into scientific uh, base uh, evidences to see whether, uh, whether it, it will be safe for consumers uh, to eat insects, whether it will be safe uh, to see insects as food and feed. Okay, so why do we need these specifications uh, as far as regulations are concerned? Uh, one might ask, uh, isn't the general standards uh, for food and feed isn't that uh, sufficient? Okay, to answer that, uh, to answer that question, why? Uh, simply because research conducted indicates that there are potential safety hazards uh, as far as eating insects are concerned. Like some insects are said to have, uh, said to carry a heavy metal. Uh, they have got pesticide residues because most of the, most of the time we are, we are looking into killing insects, you know, we tend to use uh, pesticides. So we have got uh, potential safety hazards as far as pesticide residues are concerned. And then of course we have got, uh, we have to look into the organisms, uh, the patho pathogens uh, that causes uh, diseases. And then some, um, 
some some might cause allergens okay they might cause allergic reaction and you know what about during processing uh, will there be any contamination and not only that we also have to look into veterinary uh, residues so food safety becomes absolutely pertinent uh, especially if human beings are to consume and not only that even as feed uh, you need uh, food safety simply because what you feed the animals that you know we are bound to eat uh, it comes to us eventually so therefore food safety becomes absolutely pertinent to consumers that should be addressed by uh, regulative uh, measures okay so what would be the way forward in Malaysia not only in Malaysia as well as uh, globally okay what is needed is um, we need specific regulative measures uh, especially we are going to use uh, insects as uh, food or feed uh, regulations to regulate on uh, especially on strict sanitary uh, regulations for in setting up the farms uh, guidelines for mass rearing of uh, insects uh, and the authorizations of you know the types of insects or species of insects that uh, should be eaten can be eaten safe to be eaten and of course uh, labeling becomes uh, very important okay mm, uh, sanitary regulations for packaging sanitary regulations for processing and especially in uh, uh, islamic state uh, such as malaysia uh, the adherence to the halal concept uh, becomes pertinent as well so this these are the um, these are the these are the factors that needs to be thought of, uh, especially in uh, regulating, uh, in coming up with regulative measures, especially if insects are to be used as uh, food or, or or feed. Okay, so okay, I've come to, I've come to an end uh, actually. So therefore, insects as food or feed, of course, it necess necessitates uh, the better, better laws. That is the conclusion that you can draw, um, not only in Malaysia, but I think uh, all over the world. Uh, for those who are adventurous, yes, um, go ahead, bon appetit. And you know, for those who are still fearing, maybe um, it's just a matter of time, we'll come to that. And especially when, you know, as uh, the other speakers said, as to what we are doing to, uh, to Mother Earth, uh, there will come a point of time where we will be running out of um, meat. Uh, so therefore, as an alternative for protein intake, uh, maybe insects should be thought of as a sustainable uh, measure uh, as food or feed for, for human beings to consider. So with that, uh, Charlene, I'd like to thank you. Thank you, Sheila. That was a very interesting presentation on insects. Now we know that it is slowly a booming industry, but the law is there to restrict because of the biosecurity issues that are happening in that space. Now, see with insects, if it is a cattle and the cattle escapes, you can see the cattle. You can go and grab your cattle and bring it back to your land. But a farmer who is in an insect industry, if insects, his insects, his or her insects escapes, how is he going to grab all of them? How is he going to bring them back? You know, I mean, there's no way. And it will cause, sometimes can cause more damage to the environment if your insects escapes from your, from your space. So these are issues that the regulators will have to think about before they allow this business. Yes, it's good protein, people will want to. Yes, it's going to be environmentally friendly, but you need to balance this risk. So that is why they have to run a risk um, assessment before they decide on how they can go about uh, inventing this, um, allowing these insects as food and feed. Now, in Australia, it's, it's an expensive startup business because Australia doesn't have the climate for it. 
unlike Asian countries, you have the warm weather. Here we have to create the warm weather to to run that business. So it's actually expensive. In you know, instead of getting a piece of land, you have to have a, a container full of uh, insects. But you need to have the right temperature. You need to have someone who monitors the right temperature. But despite that, we have got businesses that have ventured into this field. And as you know, my recent uh, research found 50 of our business businesses are already into this. And you know, this is all over Australia, of course. And um, yeah, it's a growing industry uh, because people see potential in the business. People see that in, in a matter of time, people will want to eat that. Uh, when it is not in a recognizable form, such as powder. You know? I can't eat it. I mean, I'm doing research on it, but yeah, it's disgusting. But if it's in a form where I can't see it, I, I'm ha happy to taste it. <laughs> all right. Now with that, we have finished with all our presenters. We like to thank all our presenters um, for their time to be here with us and to present on all these various topics that are so interesting and 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 um, and um, timely, in fact. Um, and with what is happening, you know, it's about time that we seriously think about the planet that we live in. We think of it as our home. And what would you do to your home? You will not destroy your home. You will do everything that you can to preserve your home for your generation. So if you're thinking of your home, you should also think a bit broader and think of the planet as your home. So with that, we end our sessions, but before we we go we have a couple of minutes we have about 20 minutes feel free to ask questions to the presenters um, i would prefer if you can raise your hand and say your name and say where you are from and direct your questions to the relevant three four speakers um, who are present so i'm now going to um we have karen karen you raised your hands is that do you have a question? No, no, Kat, no, Mia has a question. Yes, Mia. Yeah, uh, my name is Mia Rahim, uh, an associate professor in the School of Law in the UNE. Uh, I have actually three questions to three of our speakers today. Uh, before I ask my first question to uh, Anu, I would like to thank all the speakers here, and I really, you know, enjoyed uh, your discussion. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm new in this area, you know, insect as a food and the regulation. Uh, so, but uh, I know a little bit about the regulation. Now, my question, or maybe the comment to Anu is that you mentioned that regulators uh, are, uh, are more moral than general people. Uh, and then one of your suggestions is that, you know, if we can raise our, raise the moral side of general people, then there could be some improvement. But uh, I think that yes, uh, raising uh, moral side of the general people will definitely have a sustainable and long-term impact, but as a short-term goal, we must check the accountability of our regulators. Remember, uh, you know, tobacco is, uh, of course, uh, bad for our health, but still the regulators are not banning it. Coca-Cola is nothing but, uh, you know, juncture of uh, very dangerous chemicals, but it is one of the largest company in the world and US Senate has said nothing against it, right? We are using fat, bad fats in our food. There are some regulations around it, but the use of sugar in our food is increasing. So politicians are not raising their voices. Now we know why, but I think that uh, this is the time for us to check accountability of our regulators and the corporate greed and their you know, responsibility to the society. It's not only us, it should be the regulators because it seems like the corporations have captured the regulatory system, isn't it? I would love to you know, have some feedback from you. 
Yeah, I agree. I agree that the regulators have more power over the system as, than consumers. And I really think it should not be left for consumers to solve the food system issues and make it sustainable because uh, regulators have a really important role. And I see, I see some positive development. Like in Finland now, there will finally be some restrictions to unhealthy food marketing to children, like mm -hmm. the World Health Organization has proposed for, for years. And in Europe, we are also developing this supply chain regulation where we finally start to look into the supply chains of companies that import goods to Europe and, and try to have a due diligence for all companies in all sectors to check whether there are human rights violations and environmental uh, problems and governance problems. So I think the morality is kind of rising, I, at least I, I see a European Parliament and the Finnish Parliament, because we, we cannot ignore the problems in the food system and in the uh, global, global business system in general. But it's always about the, the business uh, resisting regulation and always saying we solve it through private regulation and we have standards and we have a voluntary coach and just leave us alone. But, but the government needs to realize that uh, sometimes even though we can lose some jobs in some sectors, we will create better jobs in other sectors. So transition yeah. must be um, promoted by governments. Others can also continue. Yeah, my, my, I always think that, you know, the US Senate, they inquired about the, you know, consumption of Coke, Coca-Cola, some 40, 50 years ago, but we haven't seen the Senate report on it. You know, Look, the corporations are so powerful. I think uh, general people must come up, but it is the regulators who should come up first. Hmm. Thanks. Oh. You had your three questions, Mia. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I have another question to uh, Sham. Uh, you nicely described the food crisis and how Malaysian government is trying to you know, manage this crisis in such a tough time, right? And uh, yes, uh, the government in different countries are also taking some measures, but I was thinking, you know, what could be the theoretical or conceptual basis of the measures political governments are taking in such a pandemic situation? Is it that the distribution of the food should be based on equal equity or should be based on equality or they should apply the capability approach in terms of you know ensuring the effective use of the food in such a crisis moment then i was thinking that yeah maybe a question you are also thinking but i just wanted to have your idea on this hmm. thank you for the question wow well, uh, I would say that the, the whole distribution of food in uh, well, which the government is doing currently in Malaysia is not on equality, but rather on equity basis. In the sense that they would look at rather what are the needs of the citizen, rather than just you are going to give to everyone the same thing. We are going to look at the different needs of the community and, and this is translated as well to the policy and to the plan of actions, where they are giving a lot more to the, uh, we, we, we call it as the lower income, which is named as B40. And these are the ones who are getting a lot more financial assistance as well as food donation in terms of food uh, system compared to the other, uh, the other types of or the other communities. And it also emphasized on uh, the whole and also the, uh, how shall I say, the, the infirm in that sense. Nonetheless, when we talk about policy, that is the policy. But when we talk about whether it has been implemented in such a way, there is still, well, I would say research needs to be done. But from as far as I can see, when, when we observe how it was done, uh, at our local uh, government, it seems that it's more on equity rather than on equality. It's not that everybody will receive the same thing, but rather whether I will give you more because you need more 
compared to the other person who might need less, but would need in some other terms. So I would say that this is my observation. The way the policy is done on the plan of action is more on equity rather on quality per se. Would that answer your question? I hope that answers. Yeah, your yeah, that, that's a perfect answer. But the question in these days people are asking is that the idea of equality, equity, and the ad hoc you know, actions, uh, these are obsolete. Uh, so Professor Sen is saying that uh, it should be optimal and the idea of capability approach should be implemented. Then I was thinking that, come on, if it is a pandemic situation, you know, idea of capability approach could be harsh and it yeah. should be based on equity. But I just wanted to have your thoughts on it. Thank you. Oh, from what I observed at this pandemic, during this current pandemic, it's more on equity rather than equality per se. Right? Yeah, That's my yeah, point. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got uh, another person, Sham. Sham, you have a question? Where are you, Sham? you got to unmute yourself. Sorry, I didn't realize I was on mute. Hi, um, well, uh, this is the first time, uh, well, Sean has been sending so many invites for me to, uh, you know, join this uh, Zoom stuff and all that about food security. And I think it's the first time I've actually joined. And I find it rather interesting because um, I run a nonprofit in uh, in KL called Yellow House. And um, as uh, uh, the other Sham highlight, highlighted, we have um, uh, a couple of social businesses. So my question is, um, to all presenters actually, uh, and to anyone who have actually had uh, or has experience with farming insects, uh, does how, how does it affect the people, planet, profit and purpose section sustainability pillars uh, when it comes to uh, insect farming? Uh, is, is the benefit, uh, how to say, uh, it, it, is it relevant across the board or is the purpose uh, drives more in terms of profit or is it planet more than passion? Uh, so am I making sense? <laughs> yeah. So well, to all the senses. Well, anyone to answer first or you're happy for me to go first? Now, the way we look at it, I think, is in Australia, um, People will, people are concerned about the planet. Um, when they hear that it is environmentally friendly, they want to give it a go. So previous surveys show there was more hesitation to eating, but then the subsequent survey a couple of years later shows more people are willing to look at it, willing to eat it. And the, the reason being that it is, environmentally friendly it is it's good for the for for their consumption as a as a protein diet because it's it's them they want they want to eat food which is healthy they don't want to eat food which has got you know they want protein you know people here are very health conscious they go to the gym they do the gym workout they want good protein so that that drives the market for the protein but also the fact that they are becoming very conscious of the environment. So that's the two main reasons that people are going for it. In terms of price, comparing a cricket bar with a normal chocolate bar, cricket bar is about the same price. So between a cricket bar and a chocolate bar, you go for the cricket bar, it lasts longer. It stays longer, it sustains you longer. So people go for it. Um, you know, it's mixed with chocolate. So it's not terrible when you eat it. If you, if you don't look at the label and you eat it, you, you don't look at it, you can eat it. And it's not, it's not horrible taste. So, but when you look at in terms of nutrition, the, the cricket bar is much better than your full of sugar chocolate bar. Mm -hmm. So the tendency is now moving towards people wanting to eat. And that is why the business is flourishing. But the hesitation has been with, in terms of the startup price. The startup price is not cheap. But people 
land is expensive as well. So instead of buying a big piece of land and running cattle or sheep or, 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 you know, sometimes you can't buy them. You know, you inherited them. You have inherited them, then you have, you are, you're forced to keep them because then you pass it on to your generation. So that generation continues that tradition of farming. So that mindset is there for people who have been in, who have inherited the land. But those who are going into a new business, they're not going into the farm. They're not buying farmland. They're going into this, which is much easier. All you have to do is produce meat in the lab or produce insects in a container or that sort of a thing. And we have got high regulations where we cannot buy too much of insects. They are regulated in terms of the quantity that you are sold. You, you're only sold about five kilos, for example. You know, anything beyond that, you know, you, you cannot. So there are people who have got this business, but the quantity is highly regulated, how much you can buy. So, so these are all the things that are coming into place. So if Shams, answering Shams' question, the market is flourishing for numerous reasons, including the fact that people are changing. People are concerned about the planet. People are concerned about the environment. People are concerned about what they put into their mouth, into, you know, people, people are changing but it's not happening fast enough. It's, it probably might be too late by the time everyone you know, looks into it. So that's my, my uh, uh, that's what I'm thinking. Is there anyone else? Anu probably has written more into this. What is the, what is the take in Europe, Anu? What, what, what is happening there in terms of people and-, and Okay, many, many company. Am I muted? Can you hear me? Yeah. Many companies are focusing on the feed, feed use of insects in Europe, like insects for feed and uh, the mealworm or the hermetia, the black soldier fly for feed. And that is, they are the biggest businesses in Europe. But also there was in Finland the cricket products and still are the cricket bars. And I think the environmental sustainability depends on the energy use, if it's renewable energy or what, what kind of energy. That will make a huge impact on the, the climate impacts uh, how, how you produce the electricity for the uh, lighting and heating and, and also moisture needs to be just right. So Finland really doesn't have the environment either to grow, grow insects outside. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I think yeah. there will be new species I will be tried. And now, now bees, uh, these, these uh, bees are now after crickets, the next one, bee larvae, uh, but I don't know. I think it's a, a good promise in proteins and, and uh, these uh, fatty acids and good nutrition content is re relevant and environmental uh, land use and water use and energy use and, and these things. So sustainability reasons, health reasons are driving it. We have Emilio. Emilio, you have a question. You have got your hands up. Thank you, Charles. Thank you for organizing this session and to all presented for the fantastic pre presentation. Well, I am agricultural economist here at the business school at UNE. And well, I have two questions, if possible. I have one for Marcia uh, about this uh, deforestation process and... Oops, what happened? Oh, sorry. And mm -hmm. all what is happening in Brazil respect to deforestation. So if that is happening in the Amazonia, uh, sector, uh, do you think that is compromising your potential to produce insects because uh, you have some biodiversity there and probably if you destroy the Amazonia that that could uh, compromise your future. And also for the rest of the, the panel, if you know any regulations about to prevent some exports or add some tariff definitely to countries that produce in an unsustainable way. So in that way, you put like an, uh, an economic penalty to those who destroy the planet. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, I think that deforestation, especially in the Amazon region will affect uh, producing food it will affect agriculture in the whole country 
because most of our rain comes from the Amazon region. What happens is that all the humidity that comes from the forest, you know, it's taken by the winds, but it, it finds the, the, the Andes, you know, a mountain chain, and then it turns back to Brazil and it will produce rain in the southeast and in the south of Brazil. So we need this rain a lot. Uh, we don't have, uh, uh, we, we didn't used to have a lot of problems with uh, water shortage, but we had that in the last uh, a couple of years because of the deforestation in the Amazon. So we had droughts that's not very uh, uh, used, uh, uh, it's not very, it, it doesn't ha happen that often in the central part of Brazil, in the south and southeast parts, only the northeast. So it will affect, you know, food production. Uh, the Amazon is not meant, you know, to be uh, uh, turned into agricultural land. It's meant to be a forest and people should use it economic as a forest. There are many use you can make of a, a, a forest then to cut it and turn it into pasture or into you know soil or whatever and they're not doing it you know uh, our indigenous people they know how to use you know more wisely the forest but the problem is those the problem is that those huge companies, you no know, agribusiness companies, they are arriving and uh, they're occupying all the places they can. And we don't need that. As I said before, uh, our pasture land is huge. You know, we have more or less one hectare per cattle here. And it's ridiculous, you know. We should use those pasture lands to turn into agricultural lands. So yes, uh, I think that deforestation in the Amazon is compromising the potential for us to product food, not because uh, we, I don't know, it will turn into a desert and it will not produce anymore, but because the rest of the country will not have enough rain, enough water. So this is a problem. And we have to remember that uh, the, 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 the most part of what we produce in terms of grains is to export. So the soybeans, they go to China to feed porks in China. So it's not to feed our people here in Brazil. Okay. I could continue and I agree with Emilio that the trade, trade issue is very important and uh, trade policy and uh, supply chain due diligence and uh, development policy all needs to be aligned and coherent to support only sustainable products being traded. And the EU is, I would just participate in this webinar on Monday, uh, how the EU sees this, the European Union, and there is some, some efforts towards this direction. So putting in the EU Mercosur agreement and the EFTA Indonesia trade agreement is putting this sustainability criteria to and jointly developing between like Switzerland and Indonesia working together to develop uh, these sustainable cultivation practices. But uh, uh, many people also um, say that we just should stop stop uh, importing. And in Switzerland also, they, I think they voted against this agreement after in the, in the referendum uh, because and also in the EU Mercosur we have the. Uh, some people say that we should uh, work together with Mercosur countries and develop biodiversity protection and uh, work against deforestation, but others say that we just should stop importing and stop trade. And, and may, I don't think that's a solution. We, we do, uh, countries need to work together. Yeah, probably an, um, an international agreement will be better. Otherwise, if I cannot export to European Union, probably try to US or China. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So we need a similar, similar rules globally. And the World Trade Organization uh, does allow Article 20, there's uh, sustainability criteria in, in trade. Um, yeah. 
we have the, the timber is a good example. I think the EU, EU timber regulation works quite well against illegal loggings, uh, at least some positive experiences, but the setting criteria to imported products is one way to also work towards a better food system. Thank you. All right, we are close to seven. Now it's seven o'clock. Um, I'd like to thank all our presenters for their time and for this discussion. I think we have done well today looking at various aspects of food and food system and, and, and how we should approach this new uh, food and food regulations and why we should rethink our way of eating and producing food. Um, I'd like to thank all participants for, for taking your time to be here today and um, to listen and to participate in this seminar. Our plan is to have another seminar on another area and we will call another set of speakers to come and speak and they will um, have their papers also published in our journal, which is of a free access to people who wants to read more about areas that concerns basically the rural, regional and remote population. So that's what our aim is to do. So thank you everyone once again and I'll um, see you all soon.